Well, first of all, thank you, Saul. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's truly an honor to be here. I've never been to Biff, so um, I've been here for two days and uh, multiple nights, it seems like. Uh, but uh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'm going to check an assumption right now. How many people are a part or work for or do something with a large organization? Large organization. It could be a company, NGO, school, university, da da da. Okay, the other side. How many people are on the other side of the equation? Small companies, startup. Okay, so you guys can listen, but this is really geared for the large organizations. <laughs> cool, okay, um, so I'm a designer. I joined Coke in uh, 2004. And at the time, they were looking to refocus what they were doing with design. And uh, by the way, uh, that's another talk, but uh, you hear a lot about design-driven organizations. Well, every company, every organization designs. They just may not be getting the most value out of the way they design. So anyway, I love that challenge. I love big, complex systems. Coke is a giant system, so, um, so I took that job. And that was my path until about a year and a half ago. Uh, and about a year and a half ago, uh, senior management came to me and said, um, look, we want you to uh, focus on innovation and entrepreneurship. And at the time, I said, um, OK, that's cool, but what do you mean by innovation? You know, and the guy you know, looked back at me and said, OK, if you don't know what innovation means, then, you know. But I wanted to know what was underneath that. You know, what, a, what are we not doing in innovation? So long story short, uh, what that meant and what it means today is there are so much happening. There's so much happening as far as dis disruption goes on the sort of negative side, but also on the opportunity side that it, any large organization, if you're not looking at the way you, if you will, innovate, you know, if you're not innovating the way you innovate now, uh, you know, you're, you're you're uh, sort of doomed for destruction. So, um, so we looked back and, and, and just did that, looked at our systems around innovation, and, um, and uh, that's the journey I'm going to talk to you about today. Okay, um, again, we haven't been talking about this very long. So when, Saul, when I talked to Saul about six weeks ago, I just come back from uh, Sydney. There's an Australia theme here, but I um, just came back from Sydney, and I was asked to talk to the startup community there. And, uh, you know, so I did a quick talk, 15-minute talk like this, and then an hour and a half of Q&A after that. And it really got in deep on what we're trying to do. Because it's kind of peculiar, a big company coming into the startup ecosystem. And I, and I get that. So I got home to Atlanta. I live in Atlanta. Got home to Atlanta. And, and then my, uh, checked my Twitter feed and uh, everything. And it was, everything was blowing up with this blog post. So everyone's sending me this. And it's a, it's a good frame. So Coke may be getting into the accelerated business again. What's the point? And I love that what's the point piece. So, um, uh, so that. That piece, if, you can, if you're in the side of a large organization and you're trying to create change, that's something that I'm sure you ask yourself, uh, or at least I ask myself daily. You know, sometimes it's really hard, right? So sometimes I just say, you know, what's the point? Why am I doing this? And then on the outside uh, of Coke, especially, especially with the startup community, they say, what's the point, Coke? You know, why are you getting into our space, the ecosystem? Aren't you big enough? You know, how many countries, more countries do you need to be in, and so forth? So, um, so what's the point? Well, my story starts in uh, 1996, 1996, and um, these are early days of the web. This is, uh, I don't know, heard some chuckles, so everybody, some people remember Excite. Um, me and uh, another designer and an engineer got together, and uh, this is early days of the web, but we thought, um, well, we looked around, and we saw that a lot of big co companies were trying to get into the web, on the web, into the internet. And at the time, they were calling web pages, so everybody, every big company wanted to create their own web page. So we said, why don't we start a consulting firm, a company, to help big companies do that. Now, we had no idea how to do that. Nobody knew how to do that, but we, um, we sold that. And, um, uh, we, <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Um, but before I go there, let me, um, let me just give you some context. So now it's uh, often referred to as you know, Web 1.0. At the time, it was just chaos. You know? But uh, 100,000 websites uh, at the time. Now, today, there are over 700 million. So there's a very small number back then. You know, before broadband, dial-up was how you access the internet. Before Steve went back to Apple and before Google. So anyway, the story continues. Um, we started working with some large corporations, and uh, actually, we reached profitability in a couple months. And this thing started taking off like a rocket. So um, uh, we got to a stage that most startups, if you're in a startup, you, you know this, but most startups struggle with scale. And uh, just like every other startup, we got to that place where we started to scale, and we couldn't agree on how we were going to do this. Uh, actually. Off the record, we were using a lot of students. We were teaching at the time. We were using a lot of students for our employees, and that wasn't going to scale. So anyway, we just couldn't figure that out. So we folded that company, and uh, I went on. So went on to uh, work for a company called Studio Archetype, who was uh, founded by a guy named Clement Mock. And at the time, uh, this is like a year after that, at the time, it, 
you know, things that evolved and all the large corporations that were trying to go get into the web wanted to be called an e-business. So if you're leveraging web-based technologies, you're all of a sudden an e-business. That's cool. So we started working with companies to do that. And, um, uh, you know, at that same time, more, uh, more readily, were these things, dot-coms. And um, so large, at the time, large companies were trying to get online and other small companies were trying to become those uh, in the form of, you know, dot-coms. And everyone has their own story, but um, I worked with a few of them, and this was my favorite. Uh, they're based in London. Actually, does anybody remember Boo.com? Yeah, a couple people. So Boo.com, sort of famous uh, sort of case study for what Steve was talking about. Uh, Boo worked through, or blew through, $70 million before they released their first product. I'm going to say that again. $70 million before they released their first product, right? And then by the time they released it, they designed it for a broadband world. Well, 98% of the world wasn't on, didn't have broadband capabilities. So, yeah, you guessed it, they died in six months. So that was the dot-com, you know, upside, downside of the, of the bubble. And then came the lean startup, and I won't go into that because Steve did a, told a great story around that, but uh, so this is around 2003, 2004, when a new model was introduced into this whole mix. And Steve described the model, so I won't go there, but it's almost the opposite of what that, that uh, you know, sort of boo.com or dot-coms were used to. In other words, little to no cash and really designing something for the, the person in mind and collaborating with the end user in mind. That was a whole different model. Okay, so let's fast forward to today. Fast forward today. So startups, founders are not, uh, you know, in the closet, in the garage anymore. Right, it's mainstream. I mean, tech stars, you know, had a, a reality show, right? So, I mean, startups are everywhere, right? And some of that is a little bit silly, right? Some of that is just pop culture, but most of it is a good thing. It's a great thing because today we have more tools than ever before, right? And they're accessible to everyone, 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 all around the world. So I'm going to walk through some of that now. So Startup Weekend. How many people know Startup Weekend? Yeah, if you don't, you should know Startup Weekend. So Startup Weekend founded about three years ago. And essentially, it's a, it's a nonprofit that is there to help people go from an idea to starting a startup in 54 hours. So for 100 bucks, you can go take your idea and launch a startup. It's an amazing thing. Everyone knows Kickstarter, but there's all, there are all kinds of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding models that are evolving right now. This is spinning off in, in many, many different ways. But again, you used to have to have uh, uh, some sort of loan or rich uncle right, to start up something. Well, you don't now, right? And then space. I remember when we started our thing, we were so strapped for cash. It was very difficult, but we had to, we had to rent a place. You know, we started having meetings in Starbucks, and they kicked us out <laughs> after a few of those. So, um, you know, but you don't have to do that anymore, right? There are you know, co-working spaces in every city on the planet. In fact, they're about three within a mile from here, right? So you can go rent a desk. You and I, it's all you and I can go start a company, rent a desk, and we're up and going. And then uh, accelerators, accelerators and incubators. Every large organization, every company, every university pretty much has some sort of incubator program where they provide some seed funding and some mentorship to get your thing going. So that's led to this, a global ecosystem, right? A global startup ecosystem. And it's uh, obviously much bigger than Silicon Valley. This is the planet. Actually, this is a Startup Genome. If you get bored of this talk, just go to that site, Startup Genome. It's a great site. They, they map the whole um, startup community. But anyway, um, so that's where we are. We're at this you know, st state of a global startup ecosystem. Now, last week I was in Denver, and I actually talked to this guy who did the study, and uh, said that in Colorado, uh, that the, a new startup is launched every 72 hours. Every 72 hours is a startup that's launched. Now, you have to, you have to ask yourself, since uh, Steve and Eric Reese and others you know, started this whole lean startup movement, uh, it's 10 years later. Is this what it's really all about, right? Starting new things, starting a lot of new things around the world, starting? I'd suggest no, because 95% of all startups fail, right? 95% of all startups fail. So what's the problem? What's, what do we do with that? Startups know how to start, but most struggle with scale. Yeah? Most struggle with scale. And the ironic thing is that big companies know how to scale, but don't know how to start. <laughs> That's the thing, right? So here's this, and it's, it's not that starting is the opposite of scaling, it's just different. So starting is about developing assets. You know, you don't have anything. You don't have a brand, you don't have a product, you don't, you don't have anything. Relationships. Rapid learning, Steve talked about that. Rapid learning, failing fast, rapid learning. 
uh, exploration, pivoting, and, and lean, you have to be lean. You don't have much to go on, right? And then scaling is, is all about leveraging assets. Again, if you work for a large organization, you know this. You have assets, it's just about leveraging those, right? Uh, network effects, economies of scale, right? Execution, planning, and everything is big. And for our company, we think in millions and billions. You know, we don't think in tens and thousands, right? And, you know, someone said it before, actually, a couple of speakers ago, but oftentimes people look at large organizations and they say, well, they just don't get it. You know, use these phrases a lot, but it's not the case. They, they're designed to be that, right? This company, the company I work for, is designed to be that way. Startups are designed to be that way. So it's not that nobody gets it, it's just that the companies, these are designed that way. Okay, so speaking of scale, in case you're not familiar with Coke, uh, just to give you a quick numbers. $17 billion brands, uh, we have 500 brands in our portfolio. Uh, 17 of those are uh, billion dollar brands. So a billion dollars revenue, uh, annual revenue. We're uh, local in 207 countries. And um, actually one of the reasons why I like working for Coke is that it's, it's that. We're in essentially every city on the planet. Uh, people always ask me, what are the other two countries that you're not in? Uh, it's North Korea and Cuba, by the way. Um, anyway, 700,000 employees, actually closer to 770. 20 million customers. So when you buy a Coke or a Minute Maid or something, you don't go to a Coke store, right? We, we sell everything we sell through a retailer. And that can be a big one at Walmart or like the guy on the corner down the street. Those are customers. So we have 20 million of those you know, distribution channels. Uh, and then 70 million uh, likes on Facebook. So huge audience there. And then the big one, 1 1.8 uh, billion uh, servings a day. So almost, two, we, almost two, you know, 2 billion people drink something from our company every day, every day. We make about a million of something a minute. So I'll talk for another you know, five minutes, we'll have made five million of something. Right? So we operate in large scale. So here's the big idea. What if we could make it easier for starters to be scalers and scalers to be starters? That's the big idea. Does it make sense? Yeah. How do you do that? Okay, so <laughs> I think that's a great idea. It's a brilliant idea. So go Butler, you know, you're so I'll said this, but Cool, okay, that's a great slide, PowerPoint slide. Now go do it inside of Coke. You know? So it's a great idea. And so I'm gonna walk you through where we are right now. We're learning by doing, we're failing all over the place, we're trying new things, and I'm just gonna kind of share with you where we are on the journey. Um, we learned right away that we needed to hire some starters, some professional starters. So we hired co-founders, literally co-founders, people who had started startups, and some had failed, some had been successful, and we said, look, we wanna start this thing, we want you. So we've, we're hiring, uh, we're launching uh, eight or nine of these this year, so in different cities around the world. Uh, and you can see behind them the whiteboard, lean startup process. Again, what I told you before, there's so many things, the business model canvas, so many tools out there that, you know, are available to anybody. You're kind of stupid to not take advantage of that. So anyway, hiring co-founders. We're going right into the uh, startup community. So this is a co-working space in um, uh, San Francisco in the Tenderloin District called WeWork, if you're from San Francisco. And these are the co-founders that we have there. What you can't see are the other 300 startups around them. So um, anyway, that's their office. And then, again, the big idea is that we have all these assets. Coke has all these assets. And if you work for a large organization, think about your assets. But in our case, we have uh, one of those is uh, our fleet. We have a huge fleet. We have more vehicles than all the delivery services combined. So D DHL, EPS, all that combined. So what if you could open that up to not only our co-founders inside, but also the startup community, and say, what would you do with that? If you could, you know, reconceive that. And then relationships. Uh, this is uh, Mutar Kent, our chairman, shaking hands with Obama and, and Bonnet. So again, we have all these relationships. And if you, if you have a startup, these are the things you dream about. If I could just pick up the phone and call whoever. We have all these assets that are just there, right? And then we're looking at big problems. We're looking at problems that are close to us. And um, actually, this was leaked <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Uh, but we're working on a, a thing to help people find jobs. And if you look at youth un unemployment um, in this country, but also uh, more so in other countries, it's a huge problem. You know? So we're looking at the same problems that other people are looking at. Um, and uh, early on, we went to, uh, speaking of Startup Weekend, we went to Startup Weekend and said, look, we, we don't want to just write you a check. You know, how can we really help you? And first of all, they said, um, uh, well, great, you're Coke. Uh, you're the first non-tech company that we've ever worked with. So, uh, what do you do? You know, so we started talking to them about what we can do, and it uh, turns out there's a whole community of uh, hardware startups and makers that uh, haven't been as, uh, haven't been given the, the accessibility to some of these kind of tools. And so we said, cool, we'll uh, sponsor 10 maker-themed startup weekends. And so we're doing that. 
Uh, that's the first one we did last, last month, actually in Seattle. Uh, and then speaking of makers, uh, you know, maker fairs all over the place, we're supporting maker fairs, but again, not writing checks. Our people are going there to help people make stuff. That's what we do, right? We have factories, we, we make stuff. Um, and uh, again, it's very easy for us to think uh, at a global scale. So actually uh, in November, we're gonna uh, work with the Startup Weekend people to um, uh, do the first Startup Weekend in Myanmar, uh, which I'm personally very excited about. They never had one there, so uh, that should be cool. And then, um, then we thought, okay, after all that, what if we could apply some of that on the inside of Coke, right? On the inside. So we started doing our, our version of internal startup weekends inside of Coke. And this is the first one. We put a big invite out there. We were hoping, I asked the founders, what's the minimum of people that can come? Because I, I didn't know how many people were going to show up. He said 40, uh, 120 showed up. So we did a startup weekend and, and it used the same tools inside. So, um, and then the other thing we, we we, uh, again, we had a lot of experiments here, but we created a co-working space inside Coke. So we could get people to have some uh, collisions inside, different functions uh, coming there to work. Uh, we're using that space to do uh, uh, unconferences, if everybody knows what unconferences, unstructured meeting. You know, actually, let me say it quickly. Uh, <laughs> you don't have unstructured meetings in big companies, right? So this is a very foreign concept for most people. Um, and then next week, actually, we're having our first uh, failure conference where we've asked people to come and, and talk about the failures, but actually the learning that they got out of that failure. So this is all new, but this is a way that we're you know, regenerating the culture. And last one, um, hackathons. Actually, I was talking to somebody at lunch. Hackathons is, is like the new cool inside of our company. So we're opening up data, we're opening up factories, and inviting not just people inside, but people on the outside. Actually, these are students at this, at this particular hackathon to look at our stuff and hack it, you know, and just see what they could, uh, come, out, what could come out from that. So, all right, so wrap it up. Last, uh, last thing, so what's the point? I believe this is uh, the point from a Coke perspective, but from every other large corporation especially. If, if we got into the startup community, into the, the ecosystem, I think we can do this. We can create more scale, right? More diversity, and hopefully more revolutions. And I, I mean this honestly, I, I really feel like we all win when we make it easier you know, for starters to be scalers and scalers to be starters. Thank you.